the rhetoric has been brilliant. <laughs> I, uh, I feel very, very insecure coming up after the students. And that was really good. <laughs> I feel like that guy that uh, only played one game for the Chicago Bulls. In the one game he played, he scored one basket, and it was the same night that uh, Michael Jordan scored 64 points. <laughs> and uh, when the press interviewed him the next day, uh, after he was cut, he said, how did you feel scoring only one basket when Michael Jordan scored 64? He said, just wait till I tell my grandchildren about the night that Michael Jordan and I combined for 66 points. <laughs> Coming here was fun because uh, I've met some people here. I didn't expect uh, to meet people that uh, I, I knew from other places and other times. I, I was telling somebody just earlier that a woman came up to me about three weeks ago, well, it was more than that, and said, uh, do you remember me? <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you've been speaking for years and years and about 300 times a year, and do you remember me? And in a moment of divine inspiration, I said, Madam, in order to get any work done, I had to put you out of my mind. <laughs> Now, now you can use that. You can use that. That's it. Yeah, that. I'm writing that one down. Yeah. I, I remember when I decided to leave the University of Pennsylvania t to teach at a, at a Christian school like this one. Eastern is very much like your school, just outside of Philadelphia. And uh, my colleagues at this Ivy League school, which at that time had the most prestigious sociology department in the world were intrigued by it all. But they didn't understand what these small Christian colleges and universities are really all about. That we have a different value system. We have a different goal. Those schools are, are excellent. One, when I was teaching at the Wharton School, one of the students was Donald Trump, you know. And, and they became uh, tycoons and made lots of money and people became powerful and significant and our students have tended to go into service vocations not many of them become famous not many of them become powerful not because they're untalented but because they have chosen another route in sociology one of the founders of our field was Max Weber he wrote a book called The Theory of Social and Economic Organization, which every graduate student in sociology reads. And in that book, he carefully delineated the differences between power and authority. Big difference between the two. Power is the ability to coerce. That capacity does not have to be exercised. The very fact that one possesses the capacity to coerce means that you have power. When the policeman pulls up behind me with the red lights flashing and waves me over to the side of the road, I obey him, not because I want to. I have to. The policeman has power. It's called a gun. <laughs> he doesn't have to pull it. I know it's there. The fact that he has the ability to coerce is enough. He has power. My mother, on the other hand, did not have power. She did have authority. No power. She was a little Italian one woman. I could have kicked her down the steps. <laughs> but when she spoke, I obeyed. Because she spoke as one having authority. And where did she get that authority? Well, she got that authority through thousands and thousands of sacrificial acts. Loving sacrificial acts earned her authority. If, in fact, Loving sacrifice can earn authority. We can easily understand who in time and history had the greatest authority ever. It's Jesus. Obviously, you knew I was going to say that. The second chapter of Philippians says it well, doesn't it? He who thought it not robbery to be equal with God emptied himself. The Greek word is kenosis. He set aside his power and took upon himself the form of a slave. 
The word is doulos in the original language, slave, and made himself of no reputation and humbled himself unto death, even unto the death of the cross. The all-powerful God, the second member of the Trinity, 2,000 years ago, decided to express his love for the human race in the ultimate form. Now, Willard Waller makes it clear in the field of sociology that you cannot express love and power at the same time. You have to make a choice. Uh, I love the name, Willard Waller. You wonder, what kind of people with the last name Waller would name a kid Willard? <laughs> That's only the half of it. Willard Waller was born and raised in Walla Walla, Washington. <laughs> He came up with what was called the principle of least interest. In any relationship, he said, whoever is expressing the most love has the least power. Whoever is expressing the most power has the least love. You, you've seen that operative. I mean, here's a husband, here's a wife. He doesn't love her. She loves him intensely. She wants to keep the relationship going. He doesn't care. Who's in a position of control? Who can dictate the terms of the relationship? Who is in a position of power? Why, he is. But please know that his power is contingent on his lack of love. Love makes you vulnerable. Love makes you vulnerable. Love makes you weak. You say, are you suggesting that Jesus is weak? It says it in the scripture. He came in the weakness of human flesh. He set aside his power in order to express love because it was the only way it could be done. If you become a member of his kingdom, if you become a citizen of his kingdom, he does not coerce you into it. You are not forced to become a follower of Jesus. He lures you through sacrificial love. Here's what he says. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men and all women unto myself. The winsomeness of love. Stop to think about the temptations of Jesus. In each case, they tried to get him. The evil one, Satan, tried to get him to resort to power. If you're the son of God, turn the stones into bread. Economic power. Oh, how America would love an economic savior right now. Turn the stones into bread. Solve the economic problems of the world, and, and they will follow you. Economic power, and Jesus says no. He's then taken to the top of a high mountain, shown all the kingdoms of the world at the same time, past, present, future. They're all yours. You can rule the universe. You can rule the planet. Political power. Jesus says no. To the top of the pinnacle at the temple. See that pinnacle. Jump off. Float to the ground. Show them some signs and wonders, some miracles uh, sway the crowd with the miraculous. Jesus says no. No. No to religious power. No to political power. No to economic power. He is going to save the world through sacrificial love. Eastern, where I teach is located just outside of a small city called Norristown, Pennsylvania. There's a state hospital in Norristown. It's a huge place with thousands of people who are emotionally and psychologically disturbed. They decided to establish five halfway houses in the city of Norristown. Places where those who were getting well could live while they transitioned into jobs and into apartments of their own. Needless to say, the people of Norristown were not thrilled with the possibility of, quote unquote, the crazies living in their neighborhoods. And so when the city council met to decide as to whether or not they would accept the proposal of the board of directors, the auditorium was jammed with people screaming and yelling their opposition. The city council voted unanimously against the proposal. No sooner had they voted than Mother Teresa came in. The back doors opened. In came Mother Teresa. She had heard about the meeting. She was in town to dedicate a Sisters of Charity house. and She came down. 
People were just awed. She got down on her knees in front of the city council that was sitting behind a table, not unlike this one. Raising her arms, she said, please, in the name of Jesus, make room for these. These who are his precious children. 